Hello and welcome to this Dr. Ross Maths video on Key Stage 5 Inverse Functions. Function. Now if you did a qualification say like the GCSE then you would have explored inverse functions a bit but I'm going to recap that and use it in the context of some A-level uh, material. So this is what an inverse function is. If I had say an input free and let's just say that I had a function f like a number machine that gave you an output of say 7 then the inverse function would allow us to get back from the 7 to the 3. So if we input that 7 into the inverse function, which we write as f to the minus 1, it's not actually a power of minus 1. It kind of means that we're applying the function minus 1 time, so like once backwards, then that would get us back to the 3. And the method for it is as such. Let's just say you had f of x is equal to 2x plus 1, and you wanted to find the inverse function. Well, we can do it in our head, because if we had an input and we multiplied it by 2, and we added 1 to get a new value, then to undo that, to go backwards, we'd have to minus 1 and then divide by 2. So the inverse function would be x minus 1 all over 2. But the way you might be used to doing it is to replace the f of x with y, just as a convenience, so the output is now written as y, the input is written as x. And then because we now want the input in terms of the output to reverse the process, we're going to make x the subject. So if we minus 1 from both sides, divide both sides by 2, and then we just replace the y back with x because functions are always in terms of x, and then we write f minus 1 x equals to use the correct notation. So that would be your inverse function. There's going to be a few extra principles we'll see in this video that apply to, say, A-level, for example. So we got f of x is equal to x squared plus 3. Determine the inverse function. So we're going to write y is equal to x squared plus 3. So you remember the first step is just to replace f of x with y. Now we make x a subject. So if we minus 3, and then the square root both sides, we get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of y minus 3. Now, the only reason I'm not going to write that plus or minus and cross that out is because otherwise it wouldn't be a function. And we'll see that when we look into domain and range of what is a function and what isn't a function. So then we just do the usual thing. We just write f minus 1 of x equals, and we replace the y back with x. So it's the square root of x minus 3. And then b, sketch this original function y equals f of x and y equals the inverse function on the same axis. And let's see what happens. So if we sketch x squared plus 3, it's going to look like this, isn't it? So y equals x squared looks like this, but this plus 3 shifts it up by 3. But it's saying that x has to be uh, non-negative, 0 or more, so it's just going to be this part of the graph here. So that's y equals x squared plus 3. And then the inverse function, well, a root x graph looks like that. But we've got this minus 3 inside the function. So if you think back to function transformations, if you've got a minus 3 inside the function, it affects the x-axis and does the opposite. So it adds 3 to the x values. So that graph like this is going to shift right 3, and it's going to look like this instead. Well, we've got 3 here. Because look, if x was 3, we'll have 3 minus 3, which is 0. The square root of 0 is 0. So the y value is 0 here. And can you notice that these graphs are symmetrical in this diagonal line here? And this line here is y is equal to x. And actually, when you think about that carefully, that's not surprising. Because in order to go from the original function to the reverse function, we swapped x and y around. So the input became the output, the output became the input. Now, if you swap x and y, that's like the equivalent of swapping the x and y axis. So it's going to flip over like that. And when you flip over like that, it's going to reflect everything in the line y equals x. What about the second question? And if you haven't seen the exponential function e to the x, then I recommend uh, you read about that or watch my video on that first. We want to determine the inverse function. So if we make that y, so y is equal to e to the x plus 2. Then we make x the subject, so we minus 2 from both sides. And then to get rid of that e to the power of in front of the x, we do the inverse of that, which is natural log, so ln of both sides. So if we ln both sides, ln whatever's there, then this becomes ln of y minus 2. And when we ln e to the x, the ln and the e to the power of cancel each other out, just leaving x. And then we replace the y back for x, so we get f minus 1 of x is equal to ln of x minus 2. 
And again, we want to sketch the original function and the inverse as well on the same axis. Now, an e to the x graph looks like this. It's just a bog standard exponential graph. We know it looks like a plane taking off. Now, when we add 2 to that y value, it shifts it up 2. So instead of having an asymptote on the x axis, the asymptote is now going to be at y is equal to 2. And it's going to look like that. If we want the y intercept, if x is 0, e to 0 is 1, plus 2 is 3. So that y intercept will be 3 there. And then we also want to sketch y equals f minus 1 of x, i.e. y equals ln of x minus 2. Now a ln of x graph, or any old log graph, will look like this. It has that shape. Now that minus 2 is inside the function, so we're going to do the opposite and affect the x value. So we're going to add 2 to the x values. That's going to shift it right to. So a ln graph has the y-axis as its asymptote. But if we shift it right to, then we're now going to have x equals 2 as the asymptote, and it's now going to do something like this instead. And we could have sketched this without having any knowledge of what a ln graph or log graph looks like, because again, if we just draw the line y is equal to x, then we can reflect this graph in that line to get this new line here. And basically the role of x and y swap. So if we've got a y intercept of 3, that becomes an x intercept of 3. If we've got an asymptote of y equals 2, then that becomes an asymptote of x equals 2. And then we can just piece this information together like that to draw the graph. What about question 3? If f of x is 3x minus 4 over x plus 1, determine the inverse function. So we write y is equal to 3x minus 4 over x plus 1. And this is just a basically more challenging changing the subject problem. The way we did it at, say, GCSE is to times 3 by x plus 1, and then to expand out. So we get xy plus y is equal to 3x minus 4. So we've freed everything up. And then because we're trying to make x a subject, we want to isolate all the x terms on one side. So let's move that 3x over by subtracting it. And we don't want that y there because it's not an x term, so let's subtract it. So we get minus 4 minus y. And now that we've isolated the x terms on one side, we factorise the x out. And then we divide by that whole bracket. So x is minus 4 minus y over y minus 3. And we could tie this up slightly by timesing top and bottom by minus 1. So that becomes 4 plus y, or y plus 4. And times that by minus 1, you get plus 3 minus y. And that's just slightly tidy because you've got less negative symbols. And that means the inverse function is x plus 4, we replace the y with x, over 3 minus x. Now I've got this one final, more difficult question here. A function f has a domain minus 2 to 6, so we can see this is f here, it goes from minus 2 to 6 on the x-axis, and it's linear, i.e. a straight line, from minus 2, 10 to 2, 0, so from this point to this point, and from 2, 0 to 6, 4, from this point to this point. A function g is g of x is equal to 4 plus 3x over 5 minus x. So we've got two different functions. This is f of x, and this is g of x. Now solve g of f of x is equal to 16. So this is a composite function. Now if we think about what we need to do here, if we had some initial input x, that initially gets fed through f, because that's how composite functions work, and then it gets fed through g, and that gives us 16. So that's how we can represent this in a diagrammatic way. Now we need to work out x. So if we had the 16, we need to feed it through g minus 1, the inverse function, and then feed it through f minus 1, and that gets us back to what x is. To find g minus 1, we need the inverse function of this. So if g of x is equal to 4 plus 3x over 5 minus x, I'm just going to solve this at speed. So we've got y equals 4 plus 3x over 5 minus x times 3 by the 5 minus x, we get 5y minus xy is equal to 4 plus 3x. Isolate all the x terms on one side, so we've got 3x plus xy is equal to 5y minus 4. Factorise out the x and then divide by the 3 plus y, we get 3y minus 4 over 3 plus y equals x. So g minus 1 of x is equal to 3x minus 4 over 3 plus x. Now, specifically, we want to do g minus 1 of 16. So if we do g minus 1 of 16, we just substitute 16 in as x. So we get 5 times 16 is 80 minus 4 is 76 over 3 plus 16, which is 19, and that is equal to 4. 
So now we've got the 4 here, we've fed 16 through g minus 1, we've got to 4, and now we need to apply inverse of f to this. Now if I just copy out this graph, it might be easy to see what's happening. This is y equals f of x. Now we need to find the value of x, which would give us a y value of 4. So if we look across 4, we can see that an x value here would give us a y value of 4, and also an x value of 6 would give us a y value of 4, because conveniently 6, 4 is on the graph. So we know that one solution is x is 6, because that would give us an output of 4. But how do we work out this value? Well, let's think about it. If this is minus 2, 10, and this is 2, 0, then the midpoint would be 0, 5. So we know that this y-intercept would be 5. Now, can you see that to get from 5 to 4, we've gone a fifth of the way on the y-axis between 5 here and 0 here, which means we must have also gone a fifth of the way along between 0 and 2. This is effectively like linear interpolation. So what's a fifth of the way between 0 and 2? Well, it's 2 fifths. So just to reiterate, we've gone a fifth of the way between 5 and 0 on the y-axis from 5 to 4. Then we go a fifth of the way along the x-axis, so that x value is 2 fifths. So we've got the final solution, we've got that x is equal to 2 fifths or we saw that x was also equal to 6, would also give you that y value of 4.